Hey. <clears throat> hey, what's going on, guys? Monster Face here, bringing you guys another Fortnite Battle Royale video. In today's video, we're going to be taking a look at intense endgame 1v1 situations. So to kick things off, looks like I'm right outside of Dusty Depot and I'm stalking my opponent. Tip number one for endgame situations is to not engage onto every single player, especially if you're playing for the win. So notice here, lining up my sniper shot, I could go for the shot, but I'm not going to. I'm actually going to prioritize my shot here. Instead of going for this long range shot and potentially missing, I'm going to use my element of surprise to get a lot closer to my opponent and try and deal some guaranteed damage with an AR or a shotgun if possible. So yes, sniping at long range targets is of course effective if you can land your bolt action sniper shot, but it's not always guaranteed. The awesome thing about impulse nades that allows you to move really fast if you know how to use them. So putting them right behind my feet to propel me forwards, I pick up a nice, quick, easy kill with the shotgun. Hitting him with that element of surprise, he was not ready for the fight. With 20 seconds on the clock before the next storm zone is revealed, we still have almost 20 players alive on the field. That's a lot of players for me to be moving around out in the battlefield. I also noticed that one person is already fighting off in the distance to my northwest side. So I have to be very careful with that player not to overpeak and not to push that player if he is getting too aggressive. So instead, I want to hold my position here and try and buy myself some time. Checking my backside from the storm circle is another big tip for endgame situations. You always want to check your storm side, even if you feel like it's safe. Just like right here, there was actually a player that was riding the storm line. I call these guys storm riders. These are the people that ride the edges of the storm, trying to avoid as many players as possible. Riding the edges of the storm is an awesome way to secure yourself into endgame situations because not a lot of people stick to the edges of the circle. The people that are playing to win in endgame especially typically enter into the circle and trying to dominate high ground and middle position points on the map. So now getting the next circle, we want to build a big base right on top of the spot that we've already secured. This is actually not the greatest spot for a base and I'll explain to you guys why. In this endgame situation, there's a river splitting me and the mainland of the rest of the circle. So the better half of the circle is on the main portion of the other side of the river. That means if this circle, if this storm pushes my side of the river out of the safety zone, I'm going to have the most difficult time fighting my way across. I'm going to basically have to fight my way from low ground, that natural low ground into high ground elevation. Not only that, I am of course going to have to build my way up into my next opponent, right? In order to take my next fight. So now finding myself in the top 10 situation, here are some more end game tips for players that play inside of bases. If you damage the upper half of your base, you can actually see right through it, giving it that ghost effect. I know a lot of you guys are already familiar with this film ghost effect strategy. You can do it to stone, you can do it to brick, um, and you can pretty much do it to wood. Every resource in this game, if it takes damage, will have a blue ghosty film effect. More end game tips for players that like to play bases are, of course, to make sure you have proper and efficient resources. If I was very low on resources right now, I would probably try and take the time to try and farm some or try and, of course, pick off a quick and easy kill. Picking up kills in endgame aren't too difficult. There's only a limited number of factors. Players are either to your left or to your right. There's really not much more to it. In endgame, the circles only get tighter, but also the amount of threats become less and less. So you should be thinking of endgame as an easier game than early game. Early game is a lot more difficult because in early game, you don't have a lot of loot. Because in early game, it's a lot of RNG. Do you land and get good loot? How many players are next to you? There's players all around you. With a potential 100 threats in an early game, you have so many different factors that you have to worry about. Whereas in end game, like right here, there's only a few threats left in the field. So you can definitely anticipate more of your opponent's actions and prepare yourself a lot better. So moving forwards, let's talk about taking on players from other bases. So now I know in that Northwest base, there is definitely an aggressive threat in there. Someone that's not afraid to ramp rush and base push into people. People like that are definitely super dangerous on the field. So that brings us to our next end game tip, prioritizing the dangerous threats. So catching a player to my West building a base by the cabin, I'm not just going to open fire because I can. I'm just going to allow him to settle up and really just allow the storm to do its work and reveal itself to the next circle. That way I can figure out where I have to go. So in this situation, I do, of course, want to kill the Northwest player. But if I can pick off this player to the West and take his base, I would also like to do that. Using the player to my West to fire at the player to the Northwest is definitely the play to go here, though. So allowing them to just kind of skirmish out for a little bit, I'm letting him burn the other player's resources. Now catching a player to myself. Once again, I could kill this player right now, but he is not a threat to me, not just yet. 
that person doesn't become a threat until one of two things happen. A, he moves closer to me. That means he definitely has to go. Or B, he builds a big base, one that towers higher than mine. That means I have to make a move before he gets to that point. I'm still keeping eyes on that westernmost player to see if he engages onto the other enemy. Now taking a look at the south player, I can tell that he's getting ramp rushed. So I don't want to lose complete focus on him, but I also want to make sure that I can kill this western player since he does have the RPGs because now I'm going to have to fight my way towards this western player. So my threats have basically changed. The northwest player is no longer my major threat. It's actually this western player. I need to take out the player in the west base, but I also of course need to take out the player that's about to start ramp rushing me. So this is one of those end game situations that not a lot of people talk about, changing priorities. As the circle changes, so does your priority. At one point, the Northwest player was my most dangerous threat. Not anymore. Now the westernmost player in the middle of the circle who has the next safe zone is definitely the biggest threat here. And you can tell that he's trying to pressure me out. So instead of staying in his line of fire, I actually want to exit out of this base and take on the player behind me. That way I can move on to the next circle. Knowing that I only have 50 seconds left, make a little makeshift fort in the back of my base and catch a quick pick. Right here, I'm actually just making sure I prepare all of my weapons before I make the next move. What I don't want to do is not be prepared for another player to ramp rush me, especially that Northwest Ginger Bear player. You don't really know what he's up to. He already took a snipe shot at me once. He could possibly think that I'm his biggest threat on this field for some reason. So throwing a couple pre-walls there, I'm just using that to catch any incoming fire. That way I can get all this loot down here. Now back at 100-100, I still have armor pot, so I'm feeling pretty good. Using a natural elevation here, I rotate down to the bottom left and then play around the left-hand side of this fort. So here's a nifty little strategy for protecting yourself from incoming fire. Just use those floorboards as rooftops. It's definitely an awesome way to stop incoming fire from hitting you from above. Outside of, of course, the double ramp rushing technique, which I've taught you guys before, using the floorboards to catch that damage, it's definitely an awesome way to stop incoming fire from above. So now let's go ahead and make the ramp rush onto this player here. Basically, I have to fully commit. It's already been made up that this guy wants to fight me. So we're going to go ahead and slow things down here. Going with the double ramp rush strategy, this is how you push a player without allowing them to take you down. Two ramps, two walls. I highly suggest you guys practice this strategy before you engage onto other players in a ramp rush, especially when you know your opponent has RPGs and stuff like that. It's definitely an awesome way to start practicing your ramp rushes. Just get into a game, get some loot, and then practice. Getting back to the action here, we take all of the armor off this enemy. Now it turns into a full-on ramp fight. Unfortunately for me, I tried to relocate my positioning there and my boards didn't build. I think I kind of overextended my jump there. So rebuilding, I go back with a double ramp rush strategy. Turning this ramp back around and I found myself in a comfortable position to re-engage into this battle. I almost lost the high ground there. Here I decide to go with a quick heal with the campfire. And the reason for it is because I have myself a breather moment. I actually noticed that the enemy that I was fighting decided to turtle himself into the side of the base. So that's why I go for the heal here. But the pressure isn't over yet. That third player, that gingerbread, ends up coming back into the fight. That's the guy I originally wanted to kill. He's actually using a natural cover here to his advantage. And it wasn't until a little bit later in this fight that I decided that I'm going to break that cover and expose him. But for now, I just kind of play along with this game and try and wait for the perfect opportunity to peek him, get that quick kill. Once again, I now have two players focusing on me. So moving a layer higher, I'm just trying to find a comfortable area to where I can counter fire my enemies. Finding a brief moment of opportunity, I now take the time to start lighting up the tree. Noticing that the Northwest Gingerbread Man starts focusing on the other enemy I was fighting, that was the perfect opportunity for me to turn on him and break his natural cover, now exposing him to the open areas all around him. I start lighting up the staircase in front of me to open up my line of sight again. Jumping and firing is a really nice way to send a couple shots in without overexposing yourself. Once again here, we use that ghost peeking technique. We break the brick just a little bit to see through, and I can see that my opponent's focusing on the other enemy again. Seeing that he's focusing on the other enemy instead of me pretty much spooks me into thinking that my opponent's moving. This is my game sense kind of kicking in here. Why isn't he focusing on me? That means he thinks I'm not the biggest threat. And it was right. I actually take the time to pre-ready my crosshair through the wall while he's preparing to break it and then counter fire through my own wall. Not a lot of players use this technique. Firing through the wall while your opponent's firing through the wall can definitely catch him off guard. Think of it like this. He's taking the time to waste half of his clip to try and break your wall. But you, on the other hand, are preparing to counter fire with a full clip. This is how you change the tide and momentum in battle. It could be a risky thing, though. He could, of course, land a couple shots on you, but that's the trade you got to be willing to make. Blocking my opponent down below me again, I now go for the other gingerbread man. Just trying to scare him off a little bit here. I know he has a grenade launcher, so he's definitely super dangerous. 
chipping away at him. I'm in a 2v1 fight here. It's every man for themselves. Looks like no one really knows who they wants to kill. Only this Rust Lord player below me knows that he wants to focus on me. For whatever reason, this guy had it in for me. So once again, endgame situations never catch tunnel vision. Even in an endgame situation like this, as intense as it may be, notice that I'm not panicking and I'm not losing focus. I'm giving enough attention to both of my threats that need be. We are only 5 kills deep into this game, but I'm working harder for this win than I have for 20 kill wins. It's games like this that I find value in, and I definitely think deserve to be on the channel. Peeking over to my north side, I catch the Rustler player back out again. Using my scar here, I'm trying to break through this guy's fort and also deal damage with some of the piercing rounds. I end up landing one there, and I actually turn back to go fight the gingerbread man. He actually blows the floor underneath me, forcing me into a face-to-face -face position with the Rust Lord. Reacting very fast, I build a bunch of walls and I find myself back on the high ground. But it's not over yet. This guy's going crazy with the shotgun here. Land a couple shots. This is almost the end of me. He actually hits me for a critical shot right there. Lucky for me, he falls off the side of the ramp here. So now I use this opening opportunity to heal up again. Pretty much dropping every heal in my inventory here. I lay down the campfire and the shield potion. Shortly after, I lay down a couple traps. Putting traps inside your base is definitely a short way to scare your opponent into coming up to this area. He pretty much knows now that somewhere in this base, there's traps. He doesn't know where, but he knows now he has to be careful if he decides to come up. It's these small intimidation factors in endgame that definitely make a big difference. And I'm pretty sure it influences the way he plays the rest of this game out. Now catching him below me, notice that he's not building up anymore to come fight me. He's actually staying down below because he knows there's no traps down there. Using this to my advantage, I actually relocate to just put myself in a favorable situation for this AR battle. I was pretty sure at this point he must have exhausted all of his armor. All I have to do now is just keep eyes on him and keep focus. As long as I didn't lose him out of my sight and I knew where he was, I should be able to clean this fight up. He makes a pretty smart move here. Shooting my ramp and then sending in an RPG, he actually breaks the floor from underneath me and sends me back into the low ground. But I make a break for the high ground again. In endgame situations, you always want to dominate the high ground positioning. This allows me to get right on over him and take him out when he least expected it. He thought I was on a layer below him, but I actually went all the way to the top. I pick him off with a nice headshot and a body shot here, dealing 105 damage in a short period of time. And that was it, guys. Hope you guys enjoyed this endgame situation. Shout out to anyone that watched this one live. It was definitely super intense. The reason I chose this game is I felt like there were a lot of variables in this game that kind of played out, and I thought I can teach you guys a little bit more about how to operate in the endgame. If you guys have any questions or any topics you want me to focus on in my next video, feel free to drop them in the comment section. Other than that, don't forget to like the video and subscribe. Peace.